Um, so yeah, welcome to the Q&A panel kind of graduate entry workshop. Um, we'll be going through some slides, but we'll definitely be answering all of your questions towards the end. And luckily we have an hour. So um, I'll be giving you guys a brief introduction into what graduate entry medicine is, medical schools where you can apply for this, how you can apply, and then also signposting some key school resources. And as I mentioned, we'll be answering some questions. So we'll be looking at which universities um, you can apply to, whether it's better to do a graduate course or an undergraduate course, whether or not you meet the requirements for certain universities. We'll also give a brief overview of the admissions set, so there are three different ones. Um, we'll have a look at work experience requirements um, and things like shadowing and volunteering. So firstly, we'll start with what graduate entry medicine actually is. So it's a medical degree for students who already have a bachelor's degree and would like to become a doctor. Um, the key difference is that it's usually an accelerated course of four years. So um, undergraduate courses are often five or six years, but the graduate entry course is four years. Um, year one and two are usually combined in order to achieve this, but this does differ at various universities. And at some places, it's also known as the JEP, so the Graduate Entry Programme. So um, graduate entry medicine is more competitive than undergraduate medicine, purely because there are fewer places available and more people applying. It's also more intense than the undergraduate course. This is not because the content is any different, it's just because of the accelerated nature. Um, but the accelerated nature, you know, it can be seen as a con, but it's actually a pro for quite a few people, especially graduates who have already spent three years at university, are often leaving kind of um, salaried jobs and they want to start earning again as soon as possible. Uh, financing for GEM and undergraduate medicine works very differently and this is something that you should consider very carefully but we will have a look at this later later on in the presentation. Oh here we are, so financing medicine as a second degree, um, so it's a mixture of self-funding, um, partly funded by Student Finance England and also the NHS. So we'll just do undergraduate first, so if you are a graduate or will at some point be a graduate and want to apply to an undergraduate course for years one to year four you will have to self-fund the degree however for year five and if there is a sixth year on your course then the nhs will fund your tuition fees however for a graduate entry program um, you're required to self-fund the first three thousand four hundred and sixty five pounds in the first year and student finance england or wherever you are will fund the rest of it and then for years two to four, the NHS portion um, and the remaining, um, you can take a loan from student finance. So this is, um, so the graduate entry option does make it a lot more affordable because there is more help from both the NHS and student finance. So when it comes to deciding where to apply, even though you are a graduate and you don't need a backup fifth option, you can still only apply to four places. Um, I remember when I was applying, I found this really odd. I called UCAS about it, but it's still only four places that you can apply to. So um, it's really important to find out where you're eligible to apply because it's really important not to waste any choices given that you only have four. Um, consider the teaching style on the course, think about the living costs in the area of the university. Um, some application, uh, so some applicants choose to apply to a mixture of graduate courses and undergraduate courses to sort of increase your chances. Because even though undergrad courses are very competitive, um, they are slightly less competitive than the grad course. So it can boost your chances of success in sort of a given year if you decide to mix. Um, so in terms of application requirements. Um, there is a document that is linked in this presentation, but you can find it um, on the Medical Schools Council website. And as you can see on the slide, it really gives you a lot of good statistics um, that can help you make a really informed and strategic choice as to, as to where you might want to apply. So I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but it tells you the number of applicants per interview, the number of applicants per play. So this is for Warwick. Um, it tells you the degree qualifications you would need, so a minimum of a 
achieved in any subject. So I'm currently at Warwick and for my undergrad I studied global health. Um, Warwick will take any degree, so it could be music, history of art, whatever. But this PDF on the website will tell you um, will tell you kind of the, the exact requirements. So you'll see here for um, AS A levels, Warwick doesn't look at them at all, but do beware some courses, <clears throat> some universities, even though you're a graduate, will will have some requirements here. And here, and here it tells the interview method um, and the work experience that it's required. So minimum of 70 hours across three years, um, and it tells you what portion needs to be shadowing and what needs to be hands-on care. So I would definitely recommend downloading this document. So just a quick overview here of the medical schools that offer a graduate course. So as you can see, there are loads. However, depending on which degree you did for your undergrad or which degree you are doing and the A-levels you took, it can limit your choices. So for me, um, from these choices, I was only left with four because my degree wasn't a science degree and because of uh, my particular A-level grades. So do have a look. Um, it does look overwhelming, but often you'll find the case that you actually can't apply to all of them. So that sort of automatically narrows things down for you. Um, so medical schools requiring a science degree. Um, I know a lot of people will have a science degree because often people tend to do biomedical sciences if they think they want to kind of do graduate entry medicine. But like me, if you have, I don't know, more of a vocational degree or more of an arts degree, then these are the these are the universities to avoid. But obviously, do look at the at the document because it um, gives further detail. So these are the universities with A level requirements. Um, so as you can see for Barts, the they only apply A level requirements if you don't have a science degree. So if I was applying to Barts with a biomedical degree, they wouldn't look at my A levels at all. But as I applied to Barts with a global health degree, they did look at my A levels. And for King's College, it's only for nursing graduates that they will go back and look at A levels. But this can change year on year, so I do advise you to go to the Medical Schools Council website. So in terms of the um, admissions tests, there are three different ones. There's the BMAT, uh, the UKCAT, now known as the UCAT, and the GAMSAT. So uh, the UCAT is the most widely used clinical aptitude test. It's a two-hour multiple choice exam. Um, you've got a few different sections in there, and you get your results immediately after the test, so you know exactly how you've scored, and you can use this to make an informed choice about where you might want to apply. Um, and testing happens between July and early October. With the BMAT, um, it's a admissions test developed by the University of Cambridge. It's used by seven UK medical schools. It's a two-hour written exam. And um, for the BMAT, you don't get the results immediately. There's a, there's a bit of a wait. Um, and there are two test dates to pick from. Um, the GAMSAT is also used by seven medical schools, um, particularly to test graduates for undergraduate medicine. It's a five and a half hour written exam. And there are two testing dates available in September and March. So um, I have actually only done the UCAT, um, but when we kind of move to the Q&A panel, we'll see if any of the other panelists have done either the BMAT or the GAMSAT and we can, we can answer any questions about these. So these are the universities that will look at the UCAT. Um, these ones will look at the GAMSAT and, and the BMAT here, sorry, on the, um, on the left. So all of this information, don't worry about making good note of it, there's an article on the Becoming a Doctor website, which is essentially has the content from all of the slides that I'll be presenting today. Um, so yeah, apply to medical school. Um, it, despite what it might seem like, it is quite a fun process and it might seem scary because at school you had all the support, but as a graduate you're sort of applying in, individually with not much support at all. Um, but through organisations like Becoming a Doctor and various other ones, there there is support available, and it's not it doesn't seem as as crazy as it um, might look at the start. It's definitely achievable. So in terms of managing your application, um, you'll either be quite likely as a graduate applicant, you'll either be employed, um, uh, working a job, or you'll still you'll be like a penultimate, necessarily a final year university student. 
So with um, deadlines and other commitments, it can be quite difficult to stay on top of your application. Um, so I would personally recommend creating an application tracker. So break down the application into small tasks and it will make it more manageable, less daunting and much less overwhelming. So this is what I did when I applied. So booking open days, I imagine that will be virtual. So you can just kind of sign up for those. Uh, arranging your work experience or volunteering. Arranging an academic referee. Uh, booking the exams that you need to book. Writing your personal statement, finalising it submitting it and then any kind of reviews you need to do of any interviews that you get. So yeah, if you make sort of a tracker, it does make it all a bit less overwhelming. So um, moving on to some useful resources. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this document I found really helpful. So I remember I downloaded it at the time as a PDF and I deleted all of the pages for the universities I wasn't eligible for or didn't want to apply to. And then it left me with a sort of a five or six page PDF, which had all the information that I needed. Um, I think at the moment they might have changed this resource. So it's just kind of on the website um, and it's a bit more interactive. So I definitely recommend checking this out. Um, if that should be sort of the first thing that you do. Um, so there are many kind of doctors and medical students on YouTube that will help with um, kind of interview techniques um so i have one linked here and then we have postgrad medic um this is ollie from warwick um he has kind of content that's more specific to warwick so um do make use of all the brilliant free resources out there and we will now take some questions so i'll see who i'll stop sharing my screen oh perfect everyone's here <coughs> Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Gersh. We've got um, the two other panellists. We've got Florence and Karis. They are also becoming adopter ambassadors. Um, so for all the delegates out there, obviously they can introduce themselves in a minute. But um, basically, we'll we'll take questions through the chat um, and then we'll forward them and try and answer them as we go along. Or they will. Um, so would you two like to, obviously, Gersh, introduce yourself. Are you two able to just give us a quick introduction? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, I'm Karis. Um, I am a graduate entry medical student at the University of Nottingham. I'm currently in my second year. Um, I came to Nottingham, i done a biomedical degree in at the University of Manchester. Um, and yeah, I can answer any questions to do with the GAMSAT and biomedical science and all of that sort of thing too. Love it, you, Florence. Hiya. Um, I'm Flo. I am a first year JEP at Queen Mary. Um, so I'm at Bart. I'm still a baby, only in my first two months. Um, but I came from a nursing background. So I had a little bit of clinical experience, um, kind of knew what was in store in the NHS for me. Um, I sat GAMSAP and UCAP. Um, so I can answer any questions on either of those um, and the application process. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Um, so I'm from the UK and you guys have done the camp on the UK, so we don't have to that, right? That's fine. So just in terms of any questions from students, we probably aren't the people to answer any BMAT questions, but definitely find some resources or something point you in the right direction for work on that. Okay. Um, so there's a few questions coming up in the chat already. So obviously, as you said, we haven't got anyone that's done the BMAT. Um, but there was a few questions about the difference between UCAT and GAMSAT. Um, and in general, you know, there was someone said they were quite confused about what these actually are. Um, what's required of you? Can you reach it? So if you, could you give us a bit of a sort of overview of the application um, in terms of the admission tests? Yeah, I don't mind starting with that one. Um, so in terms of what they are, they are admission tests that are required um, as almost as a like weeding out process for the That's universities good. to pick the top candidates. Um, each university will have their own cutoff or their own point system. And it, it, they will use, some will use your academic grades as well as your UCAT or your GAMSAT scores to kind of allocate you an overall point score. And um, some will just have 
an arbitrary cutoff where they decide that below that um, they're not going to offer you a place. Most universities will publish their statistics. I think almost all the universities will publish statistics on um, their scores from previous years. So what their top score was and what their cutoff score was. Um, they're good to bear in mind and used to kind of target your like more strategic applications. But they do change year on year. Um, and I think this year in particular, given the circumstances, things are going to look a little bit different. Um, for me, I found UCAT a lot easier than GAMSAT. I don't know about Karis, but the GAMSAT, it's it's an undertaking um, to do it. It's three parts. Um, so you've got a more kind of comprehension, verbal reasoning style, and um, you've got essays and you've got a science-based um, section. It's the whole day. It's, uh, I think it's five and a half hours of testing, I think I said. Um, so it, it it's a big undertaking. It's not impossible, um, but I think one thing I've always said to people is nobody finds it easy. I have yet to come up and meet anybody who sat the gamsat who enjoyed the experience and came out feeling that they succeeded and did well. So bear that in mind when you go in. I think I came out like red faced and sweating and overall like panicked about the whole experience and actually it it, it went fine. But I think for me going in knowing what what you're getting yourself into is uh, really important. UCAT was slightly easier just in terms of timing. It's a shorter test. Um, it's not requiring any scientific knowledge um, that you might have acquired in the past. It's very much, there's a lot of uh, maths and a, um, some quite abstract concepts that, that you're coming across that it's, you can't learn you, you, you can't learn knowledge for the UCAT, it's can you interpret on the spot and you can practice and practice is really, really important to start with pattern recognition um, and pattern recognition carries on in medicine, um, but it, it's not something that you can sit and learn for. Um, it's, it's practice to understand what they're asking. Um, and I think it's kind of the same for GAMSAT, but there's a little bit more science behind it. Yeah, just to follow on from that, I think I was actually the opposite of Flo. I enjoyed the GAMSAT more than the UK CAT for the exact same reasons. I think when I see a bunch of bundled up shapes, I panic and the time the time that you get given on the UK CAT is significantly less than what you get given in the GAMSAT. Um, whereas in the GAMSAT, I felt that you could prepare and you could read books for the essays. Um, and I felt a little bit calmer going into the GAMSAT. But Flo's right, when you come out of the GAMSAT, I'm yet to find anyone who thinks that they've done well too. Um, it is, it's definitely an endurance test. Um, five and a half hours is a long time and it does not go that quick. Um, it feels like five and a half hours. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think Flo hit the nail on the head in terms of explaining the difference of the two. Anyone else? No. Um, there was a few people as well asking about revision material for um, the admission tests. Obviously, Flo mentioned that it's quite hard to sort of revise it as such for UCAT, but that you can prepare for the way of thinking and uh, whether it be an aptitude test. Is there anything in particular you'd recommend doing to get prepared for these exams? Um, in terms of the GAMSAT, I didn't buy any of the big books that they recommend just purely because I couldn't afford them. Um, so I done a lot of my revision through, for the essays, I done through books. So I read quite a few essay books because I'm a Geordie, but I'm in book. <laughs> um, I read The Meaning of Things by AC Grayling and also 50 Big Ideas um, You Should Be Aware Of by Ben Dupree. And that gives you a really good overview of quite a lot of the topics that come up in the essay section. Um, in terms of science, I used Khan Academy um, online and looked at their basic videos on physics because that was never my strong point um, and brushed up on a few of the basics of chemistry and biology. Um, in the science section, it's not difficult science, it's more application of the science. Um, so to make sure that you know your forces and your speed and all of that sort of more the equations rather than pure knowledge 
Um, and the first section is a little bit like an English test. Um, there's lots of interpretation and there's poems and reading that you have to do. Um, so it was more the speed at which you can read that big block of text before you answer the questions that I focused on. Um, as for UK CAT, I did use Medify, um, which is an online resource that tracks your process um, and your how well you're doing, how quick you're doing it and what scores you're getting and it tells you which areas you need to focus on. Um, so I found that quite useful too. I don't know if Flo's got any different ones that she used. I think you did a lot more GAM for that revision than I did, that's for sure. <laughs> um, I So for the GAM that I bought, they they release um, sample papers and practice papers. I have said they are expensive. Um, so I only bought one of them just so that I knew how they were structuring the questions and the kind of things that they were looking at. Um, and it meant that I could see the essay topics. You by no means need to buy these and um, the test in itself is very expensive and um, so it, you see what free resources you can find and we'll try and compile a list um, at the end and find what works for you if you want to know exactly how they're structuring the questions then it might be worth uh, looking at them or seeing if somebody's created if you looking at resources that mimic the questions um, I used, I went back to basics and used the CGP revision guides from A-level because they're, they're colourful and they have pretty pictures uh, and that was the way that I needed to get through some of the science. Um, for the UCAT, the UCAT has very good resources um, that they publish and they are free and again it's that same, they mimic the question style and um, they've got big question banks um, that let you practice. Um, I think be careful of the resources outside of the UCAT ones. Medify is a really good one, but there are a couple where the question styles don't quite match. And if you get in the style of answering those questions, when you then come to answer the UCAT official ones, it can throw you and the answers are not always um, what you expect, especially for um, situational judgment. But it is just that pattern recognition. And the more that you come across, like in abstract reasoning, the more you come across the patterns that they're looking for in the shapes, the better. Um, there's a book and I can't remember the name, but I'll find it and put it in the chat. Um, it's something like 12,000 questions. Um, yeah, I know exactly which one you mean. <laughs> yeah, I'll find the exact name and, and find a link for it, but it, it's just a, a hefty book of questions that you can work through. Um, and I found it luckily in my local library, but there's, you know, you can get used copies really, really cheap. Um, so I'll find that and put it in the in the chat for you. I, I completely agree with everything Karis and Florence have said. So I only did the UCAT. Um, and in terms of just as a general tip for the UCAT, um, often, you know, your book get very early on and your test will be quite far away. So kind of treat it more as a marathon rather than a sprint. So a little and often kind of every day is much better than spending hours and hours one day and then not doing anything for a few days because you will sort of you lose that progress a little bit. So I just say a little and often and then try and stick to it. Don't burn yourself out. Um, in terms of the, the actual admission test being considered by universities, do you know whether it's sort of how key is it in the application process? Um, and you know what do certain universities use it more to select their applicants than others? So that's that's a really good question, and I would say it differs for almost every university, and it's also subject to change depending on how the university wants to select students that particular year. So some of them will use the exam school. Um, they'll just have like a cutoff. Some of them will use only one section of the UK CAT to produce a cutoff. Um, so it really does vary. I think the best thing to do would be to look at the PDF that I was referring to earlier, seeing what you can get from there. But there's also no harm in emailing or calling up the universities to ask them exactly how they make use of their admissions test because it can be quite useful so for example if 
we done the UCAT and they've released the statistics and we know that you haven't done very well in one of the sections that a potential university uses to have other cut off then you know that you can maybe might have used that spot for a different university instead. So applying strategically is super, super important. So yeah, very good question. Sorry, I can't answer it more specifically. I don't know if the audience and Gareth can, but definitely get in contact with the universities and find out exactly how they make use of that admission test. Yeah, yeah. I think the only thing I'd add is um, if you're planning to sit the GAMSAT, have a think about when you want to sit it. So do you want to sit the first sitting of the year or the second? So I sat it in September but it means that you don't get your result back when you apply, um, if you're applying the same year that you sit it. And it makes it slightly more challenging to know where you're aiming for. So I was applying for St. George's, um, which has a relatively high cutoff for GAMSAT, but when you don't know your result, it's hard to gauge whether um, you're wasting your time with the application. So it's definitely something worth thinking about that if you're not sure how you're going to do in the GAM site, you think you might find it slightly harder. Is it worth sitting it earlier? You lose out on potentially more revision time, but but you then know whether you are wasting an application um, when you come to apply in October if you've sat it in March, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, I know for the, um, the University of Nottingham specifically, they like you your science section when you get your gamset score your science section is actually weighted twice as much as your other two sections and that's how they work out your overall gamset score but nottingham like you to have not only the cutoff for your gamset score but in each individual section they want a specific cutoff as well so you have to overall do quite well instead of just doing well in the science section and not so much in the other two um yeah <laughs> There was one question, that's fantastic by the way, thank you. Um, there was one question I just saw that was directed towards flow, but I presume, I suppose you can all answer to an extent. And the question was basically asking what it's like coming from um, a nursing background where you've perhaps got some experience in, in a clinical environment and a certain amount of scientific knowledge versus um, coming from um, perhaps a more science-based, a solely science-based degree such as um, biomed or something like that what would you say in terms of picking degrees if you're hoping to do medicine or going into graduate entry medicine following your undergraduate degree so in terms of coming from nursing it will again vary from university to university so barts it's it's a big jump um i'm not going to pretend it's not it it's a big jump and you are playing catch up but they know that um, and they won't accept you if they don't think that you can succeed and and are suitable for the course. Um, gosh, I don't know, Warwick tends to have a little bit more support for the non-science backgrounds. Um, so the jump might be slightly less, or if it is a big jump, there is that support there. And um, Bart's does a little bit, um, it, it, it's not impossible, otherwise there would be no nurses that became doctors. Um, and it, and it also it, it will come back and help you in the end so everything balances out so you might find one module slightly harder um so i'm doing neuroscience at the moment it's really hard <laughs> um but other people have a neuroscience background whereas we're then moving on to kind of um respiratory and that i have quite a lot of experience in from nursing so it they've said already it's slightly easier things like clinical skills you pick up much quicker um, talking to patients, which is a massive, massive thing that they're pushing in first year for us, comes second nature um, if you've come from something like nursing or have a clinical background. Um, I'm just reading the question now. I did do adult nursing. Um, I don't know about mental health nursing. Um, definitely have a look. It, it tends to change. So I know there's somebody trying to apply as a paramedic and they don't consider that. Uh, a science subject even though they know far more than I ever did as a nurse um, but uh, what else in the question yes I did go straight into GEM I didn't work and um, I worked a little bit over COVID but I, I wasn't meant to and um, it wasn't meant to plan out like that I was going to go straight from nursing um, into medicine um, thank you um, 
anyone else in terms of what they how they find it coming from a science background? I know Gersh, did you do global health? Yeah. Do you feel like that's benefited you going into graduation medicine? Yes, I'm happy to speak about that. Um, earlier when you posed the question, I think you kind of mentioned students were maybe asking what's the best like undergrad degree to pick if you kind of do have your sights set on applying to graduate medicine one day. And I think I'd say please just pick a degree that you will enjoy. Um, there are universities such as Warwick that provided you, you are on track for a 2 one or have a 2 one will accept uh, your sort of undergraduate degree so pick something that you're going to enjoy it's three years of your life and don't pick a degree just because you think it'll keep more options open options you may not want at a later date so pick something you enjoy because you'll end up doing well in that um, but of course if you're thinking about something like climate in any way then from, from what I know at the moment I don't think there's any university that you wouldn't be able to apply to for graduate entry but there are plenty that you can apply to um, even with a sort of like non-science degree and as um, Flo mentioned earlier so at Warwick because you can come from any background there is a lot of peer support so whilst the jump is still quite big um, you're very much supported throughout and um, there are specific non-science teaching committees that will help students from a non-science background even kind of extra extra coaching extra seminars and things and I wouldn't worry too much about being kind of behind the biomedical students in any sort of way. There will obviously be some catching up to do, but um, I think for the past few years at Warwick, the, the highest scoring student in their first year exam has been from a non-science background. Um, and someone who got the highest score in their finals had actually done a music degree as their, as their undergrad. So it definitely doesn't hold you back. Um, and there is a lot of support available. So I would say absolutely go for what you enjoy and what you think you'd be happy to do for three whole years or if four, four years maybe. That's fantastic, thank you. And I suppose one of the main take home messages is that there's so many different ways of getting into retro medicine. There's no fixed, you know, best route in or best course to take before. Um, so it really is quite an open field in that respect. There's a few people asking about um, sort of from a sixth form perspective, obviously as a graduate, you've done it from a degree. Is there any way of looking ahead, um, perhaps from sixth form, but intending to do graduate entry medicine with a degree beforehand? Any advice that you give to people in that position? I think the big one is volunteering. Um, when you apply for graduate entry medicine, if you have had a healthcare job previously, like Flo, that a lot of the time counts towards your experience. Um, if you haven't, like myself, and you've done a biomed degree and you're coming almost straight from that, I took a year out to work as a healthcare assistant um, to build up my experience. But if you're in year 12 and you know that this is what you want to do, you do want to apply for graduate medicine, I'd say make sure that you get that relevant work experience in quite early to solidify that is what you want to do, but also to start building up your portfolio of experience um, for web apply. Yeah, I think I'd say, so I confess, I also started an economics degree uh, before I went into nursing. And so I'd say pick something that you want to do. Gersh is right. It's three or four years where you've got a degree and you need to do well to then go on to graduate. So there's no point in doing something you're not going to enjoy and you're not going to do well in. And certainly uh, most of the universities that I looked at, it's your first degree result that they look at. So if I would continued with economics, I only did a year and a half, but if I'd done the full three years and got a two, two or a third, even if I'd got a first in nursing, they would still be looking at that, uh, that first degree result. So you, you want to pick something that you know you're gonna enjoy and find interesting to study because you don't want to waste I mean, it's not a waste going to university the first time around and having a degree, but you don't want to waste that kind of first degree result that they are going to look at on something that you didn't enjoy. If you even if you then move on and do something else that that is relevant and that you do well in, just be careful. To add to that as well, so you know, if you are in sixth form and you're trying to pick a pick a degree, then. It needs to be a degree that even if one day you change your mind and you no longer want to apply to graduate entry medicine, 
you need to be a degree that you'll be happy with a sort of a standalone and a degree that you feel fairly confident that you can use to, to get a job or move into a different industry so um i mean if you do apply to graduate entry in medicine and you keep on trying you'll definitely get in one day but you may well change your mind so don't end up being stuck with a degree that you thought would be good for gem but actually you don't really want to do Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, when we're talking as well from a sixth form perspective, there's a bit, bit, a bit, uh, a bit of mention of graduate entry medicine versus standard, you know, a standard five-year undergraduate course. Obviously, graduates tend to be slightly more mature students. They've taken the time to do a three-year degree plus or minus a year or two of experience. Um, on top of that, do you feel like you're um, in any way sort of? behind some people who go straight in from sixth form or do you think it actually benefits you to have had that prior experience? It's an interesting question. I hadn't ever really thought of it. Um, I don't feel behind. I think I've got people on my course who are old, much older than me. And um, so it, it's never, I've never really felt that like I'm the oldest and I have been through a lot. Uh, at the end, at Bart, at the end of uh, first year, you join in with the third year undergrads, so you all merge. It may well be at that point that suddenly you're faced with lots of 18, 19 year olds and it's a little bit different. But you bring a different experience and a different attitude, which makes the world of difference. And things like getting your work done the work is not any easier, but your ability to organize yourself and know how you revise and know how you make notes, that comes with experience. So doing another degree first, you'll never, it's never a bad thing. You're always gonna bring more experience and that's always gonna be useful. Even chatting to patients, you have that little bit more life experience that you're bringing to your conversations and you can understand a little bit more what your patients are going through. So even if you feel slightly further behind if you're doing the academic, uh, in the academic side, again, it all balances out in that you're bringing something that other people might not have. Yeah, I completely agree. So I would say that it's really important to kind of leave behind the idea that, you know, as a graduate, you're kind of behind because you didn't do it straight from the get go. But it's really important to remember that actually in a country like the US, graduate entry medicine is the only kind of entry to medicine. You're expected to do a complete undergraduate degree before you, before you can even think about applying to medical school. So, um, I think it's just graduates here might judge themselves more harshly because there is the option to do the five-year undergrad straight from sex form. Like I agree with Flo, it does give you so much more sort of life experience that you can take to it. And I, so I did try and apply when I was in sex form, but I didn't get the A-level grade, but I know the AS grade that I needed, so I didn't end up making the application. But I think had I gotten then versus the route I've now taken, I'm a lot more grateful for the opportunity. And medicine is quite a tough degree, not because of the content really, but because of the volume of content in the amount of time that you do it. So, you know, it can get quite tiring and quite frustrating, but then having that sort of gratitude, knowing you've worked super hard to get there, you've tried other things too, that really does help kind of pull you through, if that makes sense. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, there's a few people while we're on the subject of experience that have sort of been saying that they're struggling at the moment to get experience through COVID, um, which is something you know that we really sympathise with because it, it is essential to the, to the medical application. Can you suggest any ways of sort of um, broadening what you'd consider to be relative experience that, that might be useful in an interview given the current circumstances? I think it's worth remembering that they know the interviewers know that this is an extraordinary year um, and may turn into an extraordinary couple of years if there's people applying in a couple of years time. I've spoken to interviewers who have said, we are well aware that students 
do not have the opportunity to have the same experience and there isn't as much pressure to come and say you know well i've spent six months working in the hospital because it's just not going to be possible things like this are really useful because you have the opportunity to discuss with medical students with doctors the realities of the career and the realities of medical school and underneath it all that's I don't know if you guys would agree that's kind of what they're looking for they want to know that you understand what you're getting into and that you understand the system and you understand the work that's involved and if you get to that through work experience that's great but there are other ways to do it and okay it might not look as good on your cv if you're apply if you were applying five years ago you know you have just spoken to doctors versus shadowing but this year is really different and I think it's worth remembering to give yourself a little bit of a break and kind of take that pressure off because the universities understand and they're going to be much more accommodating of whatever kind of virtual experience you've managed to get. Yeah, I've just popped a link in the chat there um, from Aspiring Medics um, and it's talking about doing online work experience. Um, there's something called Observe GP where they've tried to make an online platform where you can actually be kind of in the corner of a GP surgery um, as if you were a medical student sitting in the corner um, and observe some of the skills. And there's also Age UK is doing, instead of going to visit elderly people in the community that have nobody else to talk to, um, they're starting phone calls and video calls. Um, so it is a little bit, it's definitely a unique situation. Um, like Flo said, they do definitely take into account. They're not, they're not horrible people, they're lovely people. A lot of the people that interview you will be doctors themselves and will understand. Um, but if there is something that you're looking to do, um, check out that website and there might be a few ideas there. Thanks very much. Oh, sorry. Um, definitely also, you are sort of, if you have already put your application in and you're trying to fulfill the work experience requirements, then do get in touch with the university, see which of the maybe online platforms they might prefer, what they're willing to accept, just so they don't want any sort of bad surprises. So do, do check with them. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I suppose it's important to remember that, like you say, everyone's in the same boat um, and that, you know, it's not just you who's struggling at the moment. Um, there's a few people asking about um, personal statements and I suppose you three have got quite a unique perspective because you've completed work at uh, um, personal statements sorry for your undergraduate degrees and then also for your graduate degrees how sort of important is a personal statement and does it make does it have a big weighting in the application process happy to go first here although we're happy to add so for Warwick um, this was the case the year I applied to two years ago and I think it's still the case but again for double check um, they do not look at your personal statement at all so um, at no point in the application process will the personal statement be looked at obviously you do still write one anyway because the other three you need to probably will have a look and um, the only thing that I would recommend is um, kind of capitalise on the fact that you a graduate that you've been studying to get your two one to get your first whilst also kind of gaining all the work experience requirements and that you sort of just highlight how good you are at managing your time and kind of relate that to the accelerated nature of the graduate course i think that can kind of be quite impressive it's quite um reflective thing to write down that you know you've considered the how, how difficult a graduate course is because it's um, kind of pushed into three years and that you do believe you have a kind of organisation so I definitely highlight that but um, other than that I'll hand over to you guys. Yeah I think you definitely have to write you you can't get out of writing it whether or not your university is going to look at it and um, I think so for me, I also did an application for Bart's undergrad um, as well as uh, Bart's, George's and Warwick grad. And Bart's undergrad do use the personal statement. They have it in front of them in the interview. 
and they will go through it and pick out sections to talk about it's not so much the case or it wasn't the case at all in any of the universities running MMIs and um, because the stations are the stations and they're not kind of tailored to your personal statement but definitely it's worth thinking if you're applying to the undergrads where you might or if it's a grad that has a panel interview it might be something that they uh, take more seriously and look at even if it's not at the beginning of the application process they might use it in the interview i think my personal statement is probably quite different to everybody else's just because of coming from a clinical background um and other nurses i've spoken to we almost have the opposite we have too much experience to fit in that short space um, and it's about picking out the key points and grouping things together so if there's anybody coming from a clinical background and um, that's listening it is about picking out the key bits rather than just listing every single ward or department that you've worked in group them into similar into similar experiences you know did something teach you about uncomfortable experiences or patient communication or you know really got you to understand the role of a doctor and um, and always always link it back to what you've learned it's a reflection thing so even, regardless of whether you come from a clinical background your personal statement shouldn't just be a list of all the things that you have achieved and experienced it needs to be what you've learned from it so it's much better to have one or two really good experiences that you've learned a lot from and gained a good understanding of medicine than to have 25 bullet point things of you know you've just ticked box oh, i've done a week here a week there um so you want to link it to what have you got from that experience that's going to help you in medicine and whether that's in as a medical student your organization your time management your ability to absorb information or going forward in your career your understanding of the role of a doctor and um, your ability to work in healthcare work with patients have a think about what you can pull from that experience um, and link it back to medicine thank you uh, that's really interesting i suppose to look at as well for me i think as well from kind of my undergraduate degree it's interesting that you mentioned about um not having to have loads of experience and actually one or two experiences worded in the right way can demonstrate a lot of sort of the skills that people are looking for in doctors whether that be working as part of a team or um, you know time management etc so anything that you have done as Flo said is likely to be beneficial um, a few people when you mentioned MMIs were asking in the comments about what they are and also um, the different types of interviews you know do some medical schools sit down and you just talk to them do, do they all do MMIs? Could you sort of clarify that a little bit, please? Um, MMI stands for multiple mini interviews. Um, and it's normally, is it six? I think there's six stations or maybe six to eight. Yeah. Depends um, where you go, but yeah, yeah. six to eight. Um, stations that last approximately 10 minutes each. And they assess different abilities and they ask you, different aspects of medicine and um, there are normally a few role play right? little tasks um, that test your ability to communicate and um, your empathy and they're not asking you to be world-class actors you're not up for an award and um, they just want to see how you interact and how you respond to certain stimulus um, and a few of the other questions, they focus a lot on ethics. Um, normally in, in my Nottingham interview, the, my warm up question, the question that they always ask you to get you in the floor, to get you all started is why you want to be a doctor. Um, but apart from that question, the rest of the questions aren't so direct. And um, the stations normally are around yeah like i said before ethical areas we're not really allowed to say too much about what happened in our interviews and um, because they do sometimes recycle the same ideas and same questions so we do have to sign i'm not sure about you guys but i had to sign a form for the interviews i went to to say that i wouldn't say anything so we can help as much as we can 
with advice, um, but we can't tell you specifically what they ask. Um, there are a few medical schools that do do traditional interviews still. Um, I'm not actually sure which ones they are. All of the interviews that i done were multiple mini interviews. That seems to be their preferential mode of interview at the moment for medicine. Yeah, my Bart's undergrad was the only one I had where it was a traditional interview. And we had two uh, faculty members and a student. Uh, and so the medical student was there to ask, uh, to kind of understand how you would fit in the group um, and your more, the more personal side. So, you know, what was your, what are your extracurricular activities? What do you like to do to relax? Um, and it was, you can weigh it up. It de depends how you like your interview style, whether that's how you want to target your applications. Um, I think MMIs, you have that chance to leave the station and forget all about it and start afresh and you make a new impression. It's slightly harder to build a rapport with the person interviewing you uh, just because you're both sat watching a timer uh, in your little booth. But um, again, with the panel interviews, you, you can make a rapport, but equally, if you get off on the wrong foot, it can throw you in it. It's hard to come back, but practice, practice your interviews uh whether that's on your siblings your friends whether you do it through a course the more you start vocalizing and verbalizing you know why you want to be a doctor and talking about your work experience the more natural it becomes i think it can be quite unnatural to sit and directly talk to somebody and tell somebody why you're great you know this is why i am amazing and you should accept me it's not unnatural state it's not our natural way of presenting ourselves so it it takes a little bit of getting used to so i think that practice is really important of highlighting the good bits and if the question doesn't quite encompass something that you want to share work it into the conversation if you've got something experience that you know is really beneficial and you're on your last station that hasn't come up find a way to get it in because the more you talk about the better you the better you look um, so I think, yeah, practice. Don't be afraid to to talk about why you're really great. <laughs> Definitely. And in terms of preparing, um, I recommend reading the GMC guidelines. Um, a lot of the stations are focused around what it means to be a doctor and the attitudes and behaviours expected of doctors. Um, so a lot of the time, even if you don't know specifically the ethics around a particular subject if you work in some of the guidelines that the gmc recommends for medical students you will you'll get you'll get there. yeah so just to add the work the interview style is also mmi and of course um as kara said can't say too, too much about you know the specific questions we don't want a lawsuit on our hands but um i would definitely say that it's quite important to because you'll have spent a long time doing your work experience, but it might have been a while ago. So it's really important to, in preparation for the interview, maybe brainstorm exactly what you did, just so things are at the forefront of your mind. So when you do get asked a question um, that asks you to refer to an example from your work experience, then you know you won't waste too much time thinking because you obviously want to give a really good answer in the short time that you that you kind of get given. But yeah, definitely prepare and various different ways so reflecting on what you've done already um reading books reading the guidelines looking at youtube videos on ethics i found that quite helpful i think the only other thing i'd say is don't go in with scripted answers it's very very obvious if you have rehearsed word for word uh you know why you want to be a doctor have you want a rough idea so that brainstorming idea is a really nice idea to know those key points that you want to bring in, but a script that doesn't answer the question they are looking for, it, it's not gonna have the same effect and the same kind of natural rapport that you, you generate with the interviewer. So have a rough idea, but not a script. Thank you. Um, I'm just conscious that we've, we've got about five minutes left and then we'll have a short break. There's a few people mentioning funding. I presume this is perhaps for people who are already doing their first undergraduate degree and know what it's like to fund a degree, um, all the challenges that that can bring. Is it, you know, 
in terms of is it possible to have a, a, a part-time job when you're doing graduate entry medicine how do you go about you know obviously you, you can gain the the student finance but what's it like to actually fund living through another degree for four years it's tough um we were told at Bart's at the beginning that if you can avoid having a job for first year that's the best way um we get we were told that you know every evening you'd have to do three hours of extra work after lectures and you usually spend then one day of your weekend working as well so it, it's up to you whether you think you can balance a job in there as well it's not impossible uh and certainly the more kind of science knowledge you come with the slight and the more background you come with um the slightly easier it is but medicine is a marathon you don't yeah. want to have burnt yourself out in the first term trying to work so if it means that you spend a year working to give yourself a buffer for first year i potentially would recommend looking into that as an option um, if you think that your student finance isn't going to cover um, enough to get you through first year i think after first year once you've got the hang of it it's it's much it tends, seems to be much easier i don't know you guys are further along in it than me but um certainly in first year it's tough to juggle if you can get away without having to In terms of funding, so what I tried to do was during my undergrad course, um, I had a part-time job, so just so just on weekends, so I used that to kind of save the first the, the first portion that you have to pay, like three thousand four hundred and sixty five pounds. And then after that, so I lived at home for most of my first year, so it was in Birmingham because work it's not, not that far. And it was actually quite have to do but it would help save you some money so i would say definitely kind of assess your finances holistically and look at universities where it might be your accommodation might be cheaper um just to see what you can truly afford because if it means maybe studying outside of london but not having to have a part-time job or studying inside london and having a part-time job because that's to sort of see what you prefer and then outside of that i yeah, I didn't really want to work in first year because it was so intense, so I didn't, but over the summer I did sort of a research internship at Warwick, which is kind of compensated because it's a bursary, so there are always sort of ad hoc opportunities to earn some money whilst also kind of getting some experience. I think the only other, um, it's a rough recommendation in COVID times, but uh, something that I did all through nursing was work as an event medic. Um, by no means suggesting that that's possible at the moment. It's not, there's nothing. But hopefully when things start to calm down a bit, have a look at jobs like that where, and I'll, I'll put the name of the company and a couple of other companies that um, are working in events. And for me, it used to be I would spend between four and six hours sitting in the medical room at Wembley Arena and I would take my work with me and you sit with the radio and if somebody needs you fine otherwise you've got six hours solid of study time that you're being paid for to sit in a room where you cannot leave <laughs> you can't leave but also there's nothing for you to do for your job so looking at jobs where it's a little bit more flexible you're on call as it were um, and it's another one where you're getting experience. You're getting paid to practice your clinical skills um, and have revision time. So finding those jobs that give you that little bit more flexibility are really good. So I'll put the name um, and find some other names of companies and put them in the chat. There's also tutoring. Um, a lot of companies like medics to tutor um, A-level and also for GAMSA tutoring. Um, and that's quite flexible. You can fit that around your day. You can just do a couple of hours in the evening um, when it suits the HPs as well. So. Thank you all very much. If you're happy, we'll wrap it up there. Um, there's been some fantastic feedback in the comments section saying that this has been a very helpful, um, very helpful session.
and that people have enjoyed it. Just for everybody watching, if there are any questions that haven't been option uh, haven't been answered, there is the option to ask them later on. Um, we've got more Q and A sessions around getting into medical school um, from from a school perspective and a parents perspective, etc. And also in the GMC hub, there's, there's the opportunities to ask these questions. Um, we're due to have a short break now. Uh, there's a session at twenty past one looking at um, studying abroad for medicine and the perspective of a, a foreign medical student studying in another country. Um, so if we're happy there, we'll wrap up this session on time and allow people a bit of time to go and grab some lunch and do what they need to do. But thank you all very much. That was a brilliant session.